Welcome everybody to this uh, open research seminar at the Institute for Future Studies. I'm very happy to have Morten Schultz here, who is a professor of law at Stockholm University and also at the Stockholm Center for Commercial Law and actually since 2015 affiliated with the Institute for Future Studies. Furthermore, he's actually going to start a project here uh, for two years, half time, funded by the Söderberg Foundation on uh, this topic, risk and responsibility which we are very excited about. I don't know exactly when you will show up here, but I hope it's soon. Uh, Morten is also the founder and chairman of the Institute of Law and the Internet, which works on uh, strengthening the protection of human rights uh, and especially integrity in digital environments. Has been very involved in uh, legal debates as a writer for uh, Dag and Sjöldeik, Law Today, I guess we can translate that too. Uh, and also other newspapers uh, such as uh, uh, Dagens Nyheter. And uh, since 2014, he's a legal commentator regular in uh, the Daily Svenska Dagbladet. And you have been researching uh, general property law, tort law, comparative law, human rights, and especially conflicts of rights in digital environments. And in you finished your thesis in 2007 at Stockholm University, causality, studies in tort law argument something very close to philosophy and as a philosopher myself I should also say that you have a background in philosophy because you have a master in philosophy, a very nice combination. And you've written many books uh, also about uh, uh, cyber uh, things about uh, cyber hate, internet hate and uh, different problems with uh, uh, legal problems with the internet. With uh, several books on that in Swedish too. And today Looking very much forward today. You're going to sp speak about risk and responsibility, a Swedish perspective. Thank you, Gustav. It's very nice to be here. Also to be here physically, it's nice to get out of the house. We still do uh, at the Law Faculty pretty much all of our teaching online using Zoom, uh, and uh, all other meetings are mostly online. So it's nice to get out, and it's also nice to be more than two meters from all of you in the room, uh, just to make it to be sure. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I've been affiliated to the Institute for Future Studies for a couple of years, but we have not had that much, uh, uh, we, have, we haven't done so much together. We've had a couple of seminars over the years. But now I have some funding, so hopefully I will be able to finalize a book I've been working on part-time for quite many years, and it deals with uh, how to include or if you can include assessments of probabilities into judgments on legal responsibility. So this is a this is a topic which has connections with, of course, with philosophy, with statistics. But it's also my my emphasis will be on legal responsibility law, mostly what uh, in English law is called tort law. Tort law is a is a word that's it's not that known for everybody in, uh, it, in, in, in German, it's called Deliktsrecht, uh, a, a more general term might, might be the, the law of private responsibility, as in contrast with criminal law, for instance. So when do someone, when does one have a responsibility towards another person for harm inflicted upon that person? That's, that's the, the, the gist of the discipline, so to say. And this is a very hot topic, risk and responsibility, and I will start off with a couple of observations from real cases. <coughs> I'm, I'm not going to get that much into detail, but I will start off with uh, giving an outline of three cases in which these problems that I will be addressing have been very, well, a source of, of discussion in, in comparative law, in, in national legal systems all around the world, at least the Western world, which is the only thing I, I can pretend to know anything about, but not that much in the Nordic countries. So we, we are a little bit behind in this academic and also practical legal discussion uh, in, the, in this subject. So the problem is that in some circumstances, uh, when someone has been subjected to a risk, the legal system will fail to provide her a remedy under the traditional rules of tort law. So she will not, she will have, suff she will, someone has uh, subjected a person to a risk, uh, but 
for different reasons, there will not be a remedy in traditional tort law. Uh, and, and that is a normative problem, uh, I think, and most jurisdictions think as well. So let me start with, with three cases. Two are, uh, well, the first, only the first one is a real case. The other one is a, is a cl cluster of cases. Sindel versus Abbott Laboratories is uh, probably one of the world's most well-known tort law cases. It's a case from California. And the background was that uh, a pharmaceutical product was sold to women who were pregnant uh, that were supposed to help them with morning sickness. So during pregnancy, when they uh, became ill and they wanted to throw up as a result of the pregnancy, they took this, this drug. And the drug was sold by many different companies. So it was, it's like paracetamol or something. It was sold by a lot of different pharmaceutical companies. Well, as it turned out, uh, the drug had, the, it came with a risk. If the mother uh, gave birth to a girl, the drug increased the risk of cancer for the, for the girl that was born after the pregnancy was, uh, when the preg pregnancy was uh, ended. However, that cancer did not show itself until the girl came into puberty. So the women, uh, the, 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 the mothers-to-be, they took the drug and 12, 13, 14 years afterwards, 12, 12 years maybe, um, it sh it, it, then it showed uh, whether the girl had received cancer, in the ut uterus cancer, I think it was. Here we have, a dip there are many different circumstances here that is of interest. One is that uh, the pharmaceutical companies made a lot of money on this, uh, and it turned out that they, in, in, they had a, in itself, so to say, a responsibility for selling a dangerous drug. But there are different problems for uh, the girls who, who got cancer to receive compensation, which is the, uh, the consequence of responsibility in these questions, uh, in these issues. And one of the problems was that it was impossible to prove which company's product the mother had actually taken during the pregnancy more than 12 years afterwards. It could, was it uh, up <coughs> Pharmacia's drug? Was it another drug company? It, there was no way in practice that the mothers would be able to prove or help their daughters prove uh, which drug company's product had actually caused the problem. Also, uh, it, I mean, causation is a difficult thing. <laughs> uh, and it's always difficult to, to prove causation in, in these cases. It, it might very well be the, that the mothers had taken drugs from different companies. Uh, it might also be that the, daughter, uh, that the daughters had cancer unrelated to any drug use, even though the mothers had taken the drug. So that's a problem of evidence and it's a problem of the concept of causation as we use it in torts. And the, uh, let me just say at the outset here that the concept of causation is very similar in all Western jurisdictions. So we have pretty much the same basic notion of what it means to cause something. It's a very, for those of you that, that are philosophers, it's a very human thing in, in our world. Uh, so. But we also have another problem in this, in this situation and it is that the claim that the daughters perhaps wanted to make against the drug companies would be barred. They would be prescri prescribed, uh, is the Swedish word and the German word, preskribiat. Uh, it, would be, it, would it would have fallen under the rules of limitation. So there was also a time problem here because it took such a long time. Is it reasonable that these people that received drugs probably, or at least possibly, uh, through these drugs, that they would not, that they wouldn't be able to to claim compensation for this. Another cluster of cases are well known all over the world, uh, and it's the asbestos cases. Uh, in the asbestos cases, someone has uh, suffered often, <coughs> often cancer uh, after being uh, after have have worked mostly in work environments with asbestos. In these situations, the problem is mostly that it's difficult to prove which asbestos caused the cancer, if any, because uh, the workers may have worked in many different places. Uh, so this is what we in the law call the case, and in some philosophical <coughs> studies as well, uh, a case of multiple causation. There are many causal factors that uh, may uh, have affected 
uh, in the history of the sickness of the illness. In Sweden, we have a case going on at this very moment. It has to do with a substance that I will not even try to <laughs> to, to read here. Please do. <laughs> Perfluoro octos octa. We we just call it PFAS. PFAS in, is the Swedish abbreviation. And it's a substance that, uh, uh, that also comes with a risk of cancer. And it has been used, this substance has been used in, in industrial uh, environments. For instance, uh, in the production of foam that is used to put out fires. So fire extinguishers sometimes included, or uh, perhaps also, perhaps they still do, include this this substance. And what happens when you use this foam, uh, and this foam has for instance been used a lot by the Swedish military when in different exercises, is that the, the substance from the foam uh, falls on the ground and then it goes down into the ground water and then people drink it. And then the, the, the risk of cancer is, uh, is much higher than it would have been without the substance. Uh, here we have many different problems, of, for instance, of causation as well. Uh, we also have the problem that the probability of getting cancer is still very low. Even though it, it's significantly higher, it's still on a very low level if you consider 51% to be a high level. So this, the, the risk is still very low. Could you receive compensation already for, being, uh, submit for, for the risk? Uh, or does one have to wait to see if cancer, uh, if, 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 if you receive cancer? This case has uh, been tried against a water company in Sweden, in Blekinge, in southern Sweden. Uh, and there, uh, many people uh, have asked the water company to compensate them for the risk of future cancer. And they lost it in the first instance. Uh, it's a difficult, these, these cases are very difficult to win. Uh, in this situation, there is a one. They have a better chance in the Blekinge case than in many other cases because water companies has a strict liability. So they, they, the water companies need to make sure that the water is clean and safe. You, uh, you, uh, the, the plaintiffs do not need to prove that the, the water company did something wrong. They, they, they just need to. Uh, uh, the water needs to be clean. So these, these are a couple of cases that I wanted to start with to like give a, an outline of the problems. So this is how I will... Uh, sis the systematics of the structure of the rest of the presentation. I will start with a normative premise. And the normative premise is that the, it should, in these circumstances that I gave examples of, in some, in s in some cases at least, be possible to receive compensation already at the risk level. So that's a normative assumption uh, that I will start with as a, as a, as a, at the outset. And I will give a couple of arguments for why I believe that, that it should be that in, in this way. Then I will provide an outline of the legal obstacles, obstacles for this now. Why it's difficult to win the PFAS case in Blekinge uh, under the current legal rules. It's not impossible, but it's, it's difficult. And then I will make an outline of some solutions. And this is not, it might seem bold to, before I even start writing <laughs> on this project to provide solutions. But this, I'm, I'm not, this is nothing, I'm not very original here because solutions have been, uh, have been developed in many different countries, uh, in, in, in European countries and more so in the United States and in perhaps best of all in Israel. So there, there, are, there are comparative uh, th things you can draw on here. Okay, so the premise. Legal tort responsibility should be possible in these cases, at least under some circumstances. Why? Why, <laughs> why should tort law provide such a, uh, uh, such a possibility? Well, in, in legal theory, uh, we have we develop different kind of normative meta-legal meta -legal theories in, in many parts of the law. So for instance, in, 
in criminal law there is uh, this underlying mostly philosophical discussion on retributive justice and or deterrence and on. so this draws upon well-known philosophical theories but they get transformed into legal theoretical ideas in tort law if you exclude postmodern uh, theories such as gender oriented studies uh, uh, queer studies uh, intersectionality studies there are three major influential theories. The most influential theory, is that theory at the moment is probably corrective justice theory, uh, at least in, in the United States, uh, not so much in the UK. Uh, and it builds upon Kant and Aristotle and it's a rights-based moral theory of why the law is like it is. So it's, it's part explanatory but it can also be uh, a positive theory used to advocate for amendments or reforms of the law. Corrective justice theory uh, was to some extent or mostly actually I would say it's a moral theory that grew out of uh, opposition towards economic theories that were very popular in the 60s and 70s and they're st still quite popular. Uh, so these are uh, economic theories based in uh, modern ideas from Coase and, uh, and economic theories emphasize the l uh, that the law should uh, promote efficient solutions or the most uh, cost uh, minimizing solutions, especially in tort law. Outcomes of economic theory is quite, has been quite successful in Swedish uh, accident law especially. Our system for compensating victims of accidents in traffic, in workplace accidents, uh, pharmaceutical injuries and uh, patient injuries uh, is to a large extent built upon the same ideas, namely that we should, make s we should build systems that are as cheap as possible and that can help as many as possible. Possible. So it's a utilitarian idea in, in, the, in the background. A third influential theory has, gr has grown the last couple of years. It's called the civil recourse theory, and civil recourse theory is a is is a uh, it's built upon corrective justice theory, but it emphasizes that the law should provide victims of a harm with a remedy. So it's kind of like a procedural thing that you should uh, in the European Convention of Human that uh, everybody should have a, a legal instrument to protect their rights. So that, that's the basic idea of civil recourse theory. Not that one should receive compensation, but that one should have a legal instrument to protect one's rights. Uh. In the most influential book on law of under uncertainty by Paul Rattenstein, they say, th 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 they argue that all of these theories speak for the legal in favor of the legal si system providing uh, instruments to deal with risk related uh, cases already at the risk level. So all theories advocate for probabilistic responsibility solutions. That's their idea. I will be. A, I will. I, I will mostly deal with mor moral theory in 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 my research. I, I'm not that interested in economic theory because I think it has a very low explanatory value and I don't like the moral basis for it. So, uh, so, so I will, I will uh, concentrate on arguments from corrective justice theory and civil recourse theory, especially, I, I'm not sure yet, so I'm starting. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the premise. How does the law look? Why, if I, if someone um, provides me with a with something toxic and it might cause me cancer in 15 years, what's the problem? Why can I not claim responsibility already at this, uh, at this level? Well, there are different problems and they, uh, they are sometimes interrelated. The first problem is prescription, limitation. Uh, rules on Limitations are different in different jurisdictions, but uh, in many jurisdictions the basic idea is if you have a claim against someone, you have 10 years to make the claim, to either claim the money from the person herself or to uh, go, go to court. Uh, 
The problem is that the starting point for this 10-year period, sometimes it's, it's a shorter period, uh, the starting point is when the first thing happened. So what does that mean? It means, for instance, the exposure of the substance that might lead to cancer. The problem is that in many cases, it may take more than 10 years for the harm to actually become apparent. So you won't even, you won't even have suffered a harm within the 10 year period. So then your claim will be time barred, it will be limited before you can actually do make the claim. You cannot receive compensation before you're harmed under the, under the general rules. So you will have a, a claim that you will never, the claim is, will be illusory, illusionary, what's it called? An illusion. Uh, there are, uh, s th this is a, I, th I think this is a problem just ostensibly, you just look at it and you see this is not right, that uh, uh, your, claim, it, your claim is barred before you can even, you can even uh, receive compensation for it. But there's also a human rights perspective here. Uh, the European Convention on Human Rights has some uh, decisions that suggest that, a strict, uh, that strict rules on prescription might be in violation of the European Convention. So it's not only that it's, it's morally wrong, it might also be legally wrong to uphold the rules of prescription or limitation in this way. Well, this is the case. Uh, I'm not going to go through it. SM against Turkey from 2013. There are more cases of interest here. Another problem is the notions of what a harm is. So the, the basic structure of civil law responsibility it's it's very it's very easy to to uh, to to structure it so in in continental and civil law systems so that's pretty much all systems that are not common law systems we have three basic categories that uh, three requirements for legal responsibility you need to suffer a harm and the harm must be uh, identified as a harm by the legal rules uh, most jurisdictions have similar types of harm in two categories, and that's personal injury and property damage. That those categories are very similar all over the world. And then we have other categories that are more different in different parts of the world. For instance, purely economic damages, uh, damage to values, and also non-pecuniary injuries. Uh, if you're your feelings are hurt, <laughs> for instance. Uh, that can be compensated in, in Sweden. It, it, they are compensated if you suffer crime and in some other circumstances. In the Soviet Union, you didn't ha get any money at all for this kind of harm because they thought it was not an economic thing. It's, uh, it's, an, it's in another part of the uh, moral sphere, so to say. The problem is uh, with these categories is that if you suffer a risk of harm, you will not have suffered a person, if you take the personal injury cases first, it will not be a personal injury until your body or your psychological health is, has changed. And the risk exposure in itself will often not lead to any change. And if, you, if it does lead to a change, for instance, something alters within your body, the value of that alteration within the body will have very low value in traditional tort law because how you get compensated for personal injury deals with the economic effects of your personal injury. And that means that you can't go to work, you need to, to uh, make, uh, make adjustments of your home because you, because you cannot walk like you could before and stuff like that. So the notion of harm is also a problem for being able to adjudicate uh, these situations already at the risk level. And the same goes for the <laughs> requirement of causation. Yeah, I, 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 uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to finish it. So the basic categories for civil law responsibilities, you need a harm. Normally, you need someone that has, made that, that has, been, that has done something wrong, uh, a negligence of some sort. In Sweden, we, Swedish law, we use the Latin word culpa. We have used it uh, for hundreds of years to uh, as a as a uh, as a label for this uh, assessment, and then you need causation between the injury, the harm, and the wrong that has been committed, the negligent action. Uh, so that's the three basic requirements. In Anglo-American law, there is a fourth requirement that this 
basic level and it's a duty of care you know uh, the, that you, you you need to have a duty not to do something to be able to 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 have a responsibility we we don't use the notion of duty in this way in in the nordic countries that much but it pops up every once in a while and this also shows that how how easily we are influenced by other countries uh, because uh, we don't produce that much precedence in sweden so uh, we often look, look to other countries uh, causation is another problem in these cases because it's of very often difficult to uh, prove what caused the the potential uh, uh, harm for instance if you have been subjected asbestos in many in many different places and you want to adjudicate that uh, already at the risk level it would be impossible to prove where you received where the uh, where, you where you took or get, got the asbestos so to say and the fourth category of, of obstacles is evidence law uh, in civil law uh, the burden of proof is on the person who wants to claim responsibility against another person. The person who wants the money has the burden of proof. The starting point is that the plaintiff must show by preponderance of the evidence that the defendant caused the injury or the harm. In, uh, uh, in Swedish it's called styrka. You need to styrka the, the, the harm. But you also need to uh, prove in the same way causation and negligence in the general uh, in the general in the general case in private law in civil law uh, in opposite if you contrast it with criminal law it is possible to shift the burden of proof in some cases uh, so the courts can say that at least the supreme court can say now this is too difficult for the plaintiffs and uh, because the risk i mean it was the, the plaintiff did nothing wrong it was the the pharmaceutical companies that did something wrong they produced uh, drugs that were dangerous so they you can shift the burden of proof but it's it's very difficult uh, and it's very seldomly done in there is a typical causation cases that it, it's the in, in which many many jurisdictions have shifted the burden of proof for causation and it's the hunters case some uh, a person is shot dead and there are two hunters there this looks like a philosophical example, you know, it's, it's so almost artificially simple. But this case has actually been, been up in many Supreme Courts around the world. So either, either the dead person is shot with two gunshots or uh, just one gunshot, but one does, it's impossible to tell which one of the shooters actually hit, it, hit the plaintiff. Or not the plaintiff, he's dead, but hit the victim. And in these cases, uh, many jurisdictions shift the burden of proof. So the two persons or more that, call, that cause the risk of hitting the victim need to prove it wasn't me. It was that person who, who hit the victim. And, uh, but that we haven't had that case in Sweden yet. Because, I mean, this is a type of problem that pops up every once in a while. But we have no uh, clear... Uh, uh, decisions by the Swedish Supreme Court on, on the burden of proof. So, so these four different uh, categories of requirements for legal responsibility are obstacles for, for a plaintiff in these cases. So what can you do about it if you want to do something about it? Well, the main idea in many jurisdictions and uh, uh, that many scholars have advocated for is to include probabilities into the legal categories. This is a very famous uh, suggestion by Glenn Robinson, an American scholar. Assuming that the risk is one that would give rise to liability when the actual law is suffered, why not adjudicate the entire case by awarding the victim the present value of the risk at the point at which the risk can be identified and given some measurable value? The value is equal to the present value of the future losses multiplied by the estimated probability of the recurrence. So this is a, is a way to include probabilities within the assessment of, of responsibility as such. 
The problem is that this will always produce suboptimal results because if the person eventually suffers the harm, she receives cancer, she will be undercompensated because she will not have she will only have received the value of the risk and it 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 will never be possible i think to co to construct a solution that will allow for adjudicating the problem at the risk level and then given and then give the person a shot to full compensation after the this after uh, after the uh, disease has, uh, has shown itself so if you adju if you if you handle it on the risk level there is no there will not there is no second chance uh, when you know the facts so that's but on the other hand if the the person that su was subject to the risk will not does not receive cancer she will be overcompensated she will receive compensation without having suffered a harm now the risk in, in itself can of course be a harm in some w in in more in a more practical sense for instance we have a very well known swedish case from 1990s where a police officer arrested a person uh, and the person uh, the arrested person bit the police officer in the hand and and shouted i have aids pig <laughs> uh, and this was in the ni this was in 1990 aids was a death sentence at that time so the police the police officer suffered a, m a, m a mental breakdown she suffered mental illness and then at that time she received compensation because she suffered a psychological harm caused by what she thought was the risk that she might get AIDS. It turned out that uh, the arrested person lied, so there was no risk. But that time it also took a, took a while for the f to get the results uh, of, of the AIDS test. So she she she, so she was in uh, she was she lived with the fear for a couple of months before the the, the or at least some time. So th these are. Uh, some some aspects of, of this problem. So how can you do it? How can you how can you change the legal system if you want to? You could do it without actually in Sweden. We could do it without changing anything in legislation. So non-lawyers tend to think about responsibility in terms of criminal responsibility first. I think. And in criminal, uh, when, it, when it comes to criminal law, if there isn't support in criminal legislation, there, isn't, there is no possibility to claim criminal responsibility. So this is a, uh, just a basic uh, starting point for criminal responsibility. In civil law, it's, it's not the same. <laughs> uh, we don't have the same standards of foreseeability, not, at least not always, that you do in criminal law. So one could amend the uh, amendments or adjustments of of the law could take the form of adjustments of theories and doctrines used by the courts maybe i should also say for those of you that are n have not studied law in sweden that m all interesting stuff in tort law is unwritten law it's uncodified it's not in it's not in the statute so the statute the basic statute is very short uh, and and all interesting issues of causation what does it mean to be negligent Wh what is a personal injury that it's left outside of the law uh, to be uh, and so the f the, f the flesh of the law comes from supreme court decisions but also to quite an extent from academic writing so uh, so academia is strong in in tort law traditionally and and in some other areas of private law so how could how could if you want if 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 you share my the the premises i wrote before here that it should be able to adjudicate some of these cases at the risk level there are different uh, possibilities one could be to shift the burden of proof that that does not really introduce probabilities in that way in the uh, in, in into the doctrine it just shifts shifts the problem of knowing the future from one party to the other but there's another possibility and that is to reconstruct basic notions of what a harm is to say that so so that the risk in itself is the harm along the lines of what robinson uh, the, the quote, uh, how Robinson uh, saw it in the quote I just read. 
This is called loss, loss of chance, or in French, perte de chance. Uh, so it means that the loss of a chance to live a long and healthy life, for instance, but also a loss of a chance to make a big profit in a, on the financial market, or it, it, this can work in all kinds of harm, uh, is in itself the injury or the harm or the damage, whatever word you want to use. In Sweden we use the, 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 the word damage, but I use the word harm. Uh, so that's one way. So to introduce probabilities within the concepts of harm, uh, and that's how it's often been handled uh, in many juris uh, European jurisdictions. So for instance, in the asbestos cases, uh, the risk of, receive of, of getting cancer in the future is evaluated along the lines of, of the Robinson quote in many jurisdictions in Europe, in the EU. Another solution or possibility is to make adjustments to the concept of causation, to introduce probabilities within, within the, cause, the concept of causation in itself. I find that not very promising myself. I, I prefer the, I, th I think that the middle solution, the loss of chance solution is the best one. Uh, but that, that's uh, 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 an idea that has been floated, for instance, by a, a very influential comparative project, the Principles of European Tort Law, that came, uh, the, it, it was a publication maybe 15 years ago. They said, they, they argued for probabilistic causation notions uh, as a solution to these problems. Uh, how did the courts handle the Sindel case, the, the California case? When I studied law and, econ law and economics in uh, Washington DC at George Mason University, it's, a, it's a very close to the Univer to University of Chicago, so it's very libertarian. My professor, he always said, yeah, you know all these sick American cases you hear about, they're always from California, just so you know, they're never from Delaware. And, <laughs> yeah. and the sick cases, he thought, they were cases when companies lost <laughs> and had to compensate people. So he was very, he was very enterprise friendly. The California case of Sindel versus Abbott Laboratories, it was the case with the drugs uh, the mothers received for morning sickness was handled in a very uh, creative way by the California Supreme Court. They, uh, if the victim could prove through her parents that uh, the mother had taken the drug from any company, she had, in th she had s fulfilled the uh, the burden of proof, how much money she received depended on the market share of the different pharmaceutical companies on the, on the mar market in question. So if Pharmacia, uh, uh, the Swedish drug company, had 10% of the market, ma they made an assessment of the total value of her harm and Pharmacia had to pay 10% of that harm. And then she could uh, reach out to up John to all the other companies, Astra maybe, I don't know, which uh, drug companies were, uh, were at the market. So this, this, this is a landmark decision by the California Supreme Court and it, and it has been an export success for the, California, uh, for, for the California Supreme Court, but no other country has went down along these lines. So uh, I, I think it was under consideration when the, the Dutch legal code was changed maybe 15, 20 years ago. They thought about uh, market share liability, but they opted for another solution. But that, that's the most, it's the most extreme solution, uh, I could say, I want to say. All right, that's, I think that's pretty much it. Thanks for listening. <laughs>